So I, I guess for those of you, so I mean, the, the couple of past seminars, I was a former Karma PhD student and uh, currently at Adobe Research. I, I got the great pleasure to work with you for several or two summers and then some extended collaboration when she was uh, starting, I think, in between her first and second and second and third year in her PhD or maybe plus one. Second, eh? second and third. Second, second third, yeah. And uh, been doing some super, super interesting work on music and audio classification. And is working in her advisor at uh, New York University as Juan Pablo Bello. And uh, I think this topic is of particular interest for music where uh, there's low data uh, resources for a lot of the modern deep learning methodologies. And so I think it's a really exciting topic for, for this community. And um, you, you also got, uh, as part of this work, as you probably will cover a, a best paper award at, at WASPA last, last year. And uh, so you've been doing, uh, and, keep, and has extended some of these ideas beyond classifications such as source separation and others. So uh, yeah, super excited to, to hear what you have uh, today. You, thank you. Thank you for uh, the introduction, Nick. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Yu Wang. Um, I'm, as Nick said, I'm PhD candidate uh, in Music and Audio Research Lab at NYU, working with Professor Juan Bello. And uh, I'm going to talk about my dissertation work today, uh, titled Adaptive and Interactive Machine Listening with Minimal Supervision. Uh, so actually, I just found that I can't see my presenter notes. So I'm going to improvise a bit. Um, I hope I can go through it as smooth as possible. And also please feel free to stop me uh, if you have any question uh, in the middle of the presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, so machine listening uh, is uh, try to endow machine with, uh, to, to understand and perceive audio as human does. Uh, so it, the application range from music, speech to a bioacoustic, and like many other fields uh, in, in AI research, uh, deep learning has been a mainstream methodology in, in machine listening as it achieved many state-of-the-art results. However, we know that deep learning models are data hungry, so they require a lot of label data for training, uh, but annotating audio is particularly hard. So we need to listen to the audio examples. Uh, audio events often overlap or happen at the same time. And um, it often also requires expert knowledge. So, um, so uh, machine listening has suffered from a uh, label data scarcity issue a lot. And uh, okay. so um, existing solutions uh, typically tackle this issue from two aspects, data and learning paradigm. So uh, to gather more data, people uh, either try to do data augmentation, synthesis, or use crowdsourcing. However, um, these methods uh, either would suffer from some generalizability issue when trying to apply model to real audio, or it would still require a significant amount of human effort. On the other hand, uh, people, try, people are trying different uh, learning paradigms, including transfer learning, representation learning, et cetera, to try to use some common knowledge, uh, which enables smaller down, downstream model size, uh, which will require less training data. However, uh, these models often still requires a significant amount of label data for the downstream task. Uh, for example, hundreds or thousands of examples, which can still be hard to collect, especially for rare finer grain or new classes. So for example, a rare instrument, a specific type of guitar, or a new sound effect that you just made. So uh, in my PhD research, uh, we propose to uh, tackle this label data scarcity issue in a different perspective, from a different perspective. So uh, our first, first goal is that we wanted to see if we can get a model that is good at learning from just a handful of label data. So for handful, we mean uh, just like less than five examples. And second, we want to include human input into the loop to either guide the machine to learn more efficiently or specify the task the user is looking for. So this should be easy to imagine if we can achieve the first goal. Uh, we can think of like uh, different human user will be able to provide different input to reflect their needs and, and to customize the model to fit their needs. So we see this framework as uh, generalization by adaptation 
So instead of aiming for a huge universal model and hope it work for every classes, we propose that a flexible model that can quickly adapt to different user um, by asking a little human intervention might be a good uh, good way to think about it. So uh, to do to do to achieve our goal, um, uh, my research focus can be categorized into three areas. So first, learning to learn from few data, uh, learning from few data without forgetting, and lastly, learning with iterative human machine interaction. Okay, so uh, let's start uh, with learning to learn from few data. So we start from uh, envisioning an application scenario where a user will uh, specify a sound of interest by providing a few examples, and then the model will automatically locate everywhere else in a, in a track. And to, to match with our goal that I just mentioned earlier, we, provide, uh, we impose a, a set of limitations. So first, no prior knowledge of the target sound event. So we want the user to be able to find any sound of interest uh, without limited by like training data vocabulary. Second, minimal human effort. So we wanna ask no more than five label uh, from the user. And lastly, we want everything to be real time so that we can do on the fly uh, detection. So uh, to do so, we look into a method called metric-based future learning. So high levelly speaking, it learns a discriminative embedding space using a set of, set of base classes. And once it's learned, the embedding space is good at generating robust representation for a novel class on thing during training based on just few examples. So once we have these uh, novel class representation, given an unknown input, we can classify it do, uh, using nearest neighbor classifier. So how does this embedding space train? Uh, we uh, adapt a technique called episodic training that was proposed in uh, a paper back in 2017 in prototypical networks. Uh, so what it does is basically it subsample a small support set from a large training data pool. So here a color represents a class and a square represents an example. So the support set is basically mimicking the supervision a model will get at test time. So this is like mimicking the user provided example. So here we have five different classes and for each class, we only have two examples. So this is uh, what the model will see at test time, for example. At the same time, we also sample another set of query set from the same five, five classes. And these are the um, set of example that we want the model to be able to correctly label. So how to do that? We basically embed both support example and query example into embedding space using a CNN based model. And uh, we get this uh, support set prototypes and query embeddings. Then we do uh, nearest neighbor classification to label the query. And the model is uh, optimized on uh, the query prediction. And what's uh, unique about it is that this is just one training iteration. And the next training iteration will redo this, all, the, all of the sampling. So the model will be basically see different set of classes. It will see different five uh, colors here. So instead of learning specific class, so instead of learning class specific knowledge, the model will learn class agnostic comparing ability. So that at test time, when it sees uh, a new set of uh, different classes, it will be able to learn quickly based on a few examples. Okay, so with we leverage this trained uh, few shot model uh, and uh, take the user provided example to form target representation in the embedding space. And then we propose that we can form a non-target representation take the whole by taking the whole track. So the uh, assumption here is that the target sound is relatively sparse within a track so that uh, on average, the representation should be far enough from our target sound. So once we have this, we, we have this uh, way to model target and non-target class, Given the frame in the track, we can do nearest neighbor classification to see if the target sound is in the frame or not. Okay, so here I have a short um, demo of uh, we of how we apply this uh, few shot sound detection system to monophonic speech audio to detect filler words. So I'm going to play this video real quick. Uh, please let me know if you can hear the audio. Okay, uh, so I'm just gonna skip 
this video. Uh, but if you're interesting, uh, you can pay me offline or you can search SoundSeek on YouTube, I believe. Uh, you can see Justin Salomon presenting it. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, next, uh, we fo follow up work in the follow up work. Uh, instead of searching for uh, filler words or spoken words in a monophonic speech audio, we try to search for a particular type of uh, percussion instrument in polyphonic music to do drum transcription. So the motivation is that uh, most of the existing drum transcription system have small and fixed transcription vocabulary. So for example, they can only transcribe uh, bass drum, snare drum, and hi-hat due to lack of data. But uh, there are many more percussion instruments around the world. So we propose to apply feature learning to support open vocabulary uh, drum transcription. So here, uh, the goal, uh, the goal is to uh, transcribe any percussion instrument that a user will be interested in uh, using a trained few-shot model. So we showed that uh, few-shot model actually uh, shows comparative uh, performance on a predefined 18 instrument vocabulary uh, when compared to a supervised baseline. And on top of that, few-shot model is able to predict, uh, is able to transcribe fine-grain uh, instruments, for example, different type of tom drums. So ranging from low floor tom to high mid tom, uh, which a traditional uh, supervised drum transcriptor, drum transcription model cannot uh, handle. Uh, or an auto vocabulary class. So here, maracas does not exist in our training set, but future model will be able to transcribe it uh, as long as it's these five examples at test time. Okay. And similarly, we have a same issue in uh, music source separation system. So, you know, musical source separation model usually tackle one instrument at a time. So if you want to separate multiple instruments, you will uh, often need to scale, multi uh, you need to stack multiple um, source separation models together. Or uh, more recently, people try to condition a generic source separation model using like a uh, class label, but uh, it's still limited to a fixed uh, vocabulary that exists in your training data. So we propose a similar idea, a few shot musical source separation model, where uh, we want to condition a generic model using few audio examples. So here, for example, we want to be able to separate uh, Kerbasa from a music mixture, musical mixture by providing few examples at test time. And uh, the method here is a little bit different because this is not a classification task. So uh, what we did is that we uh, conditioned a generic unit, which is pretty typical in source separation uh, world, using film. So feature-wise linear modulation. Uh, it what it does is that it basically transform a bottleneck feature encoded by a uh, unit encoder uh, to a different uh, to a different to a different feature uh, that gets input into the decoder. So the trans the transformation is conditioned on site information. Here, we propose the site information to use is a conditioning embedding, a conditioning vector uh, that was generated based on few audio examples. So here, we uh, input some Cabasa example into a conditioning encoder, which is another CNN model, and uh, get one single few shot uh, conditioning vector that get input into the film layer. And we compare it to a baseline, which is the one hot encoding class uh, instrument class uh, conditioning. So by taking the Kabasa label directly. Uh, yeah, so this is the baseline we compare. And we see that uh, the few shot model actually outperformed the baseline on both seen instrument and unseen instruments. So here we uh, report the performance on MuseDB18. But because MuseDB18 only contains three instruments, they are all pretty common. They exist in our training set. So what we do is that we actually redo the experiments by removing vocal, drum, and bass from our training data to uh, evaluate the model on unseen instrument scenario. So we can see that in the unseen instrument scenario uh, in the bottom plot, the baseline actually can do nothing because uh, it's not in the training vocabulary but uh, Fuchsia model is able to still separate it with a uh, reasonable uh, SDR score. Okay. And another cool thing that we explore in this work is that we explore negative conditioning samples. And we found that providing, 
So not only providing what example a user is interested in, but also provide additional information about what instrument we don't want to separate. So we found that provide that additional information actually uh, helps further improve the separation uh, quality. Okay, so um, in my next uh, focus is learning from few data without forgetting. Um, the motivation is that, okay, we now know that future learning is powerful. We can learn new uh, class quickly. However, future learning uh, tends to forget what it sees at training time. So it's good at learning new things, but uh, the training class vocabulary is not maintained. So it's, it's good to have this few shot sound, sound recognition system, but if we want it to work with large vocabulary, it's gonna um, require manual labeling, like manually provide few examples for each class, um, every, for, for every class you're interested in. So that can be, uh, that can be over, overwhelming if you are aiming for a large vocab uh, problem. So we propose another uh, paradigm here we envision we have a base classifier that can already take care of a set of base classes, um, uh, which can be like some common class we already have a lot of training data on. And then on top of that, we want to be able to expand the output vocabulary further by adding new classes, but um, based on just few examples. So here, for example, we want to add Kabasa into our output vocabulary by just providing five examples of it. So we can uh, formulate this as a few shot continual learning problem where the few shot means we only provide few example per novel class and the continual learning part means we want to uh, build upon and ex build on top of existing base vocabulary and then keep growing the output uh, vocabulary. Okay, and to do so, we look into a technique called dynamic few shot learning, which is uh, originally proposed in image domain. So what it does is that um, we can view that base classifier as two parts. So first the feature extractor, and then the your last classification layer, which is basically a weight matrix, uh, which uh, has n rows where n represents your output vocabulary size. So here we can predict n classes in our base classifier. Uh, so what we do is that we extend the base classifier by adding additional module called few shot weight generator which uh, takes in few novel example and uh, to compute and compute the feature of those novel example and also use the use the feature to look up uh, to uh, to do attention uh, on the base weight matrix to generate a new uh, classification weight vector for that new class. So basically generate a new vector and then if you combine the original uh, weight matrix with the new, this new vector, you essentially um, increase the output vocabulary from n to n plus one. So that uh, effectively expand your output vocabulary. Okay. So uh, we do uh, our uh, experiments on audio set and also ESC50. I'm also only showing audio set results here. So we um, take 120 classes in audio set and split it into 100 training classes and 20 classes that the model has never seen before. And it's only used for testing. So our base classifier that's only trained on 100 classes can only predict 100 classes. So we can do nothing on the 20 classes. And with our uh, dynamic future learning methods, we are able to predict novel classes without sacrificing too much on base class performance. Uh, while you can see that there's still the performance gap between base and novel classes, but uh, we compare our methods to three different uh, baseline methods, including pure Supervised, ranging from pure supervised uh, methods to pure few shot methods and see that uh, our proposed method actually performs much better uh, than the baselines. Okay, oh, and one thing to add is that a follow-up, we also do a follow-up work on, based on this to um, explore um, all the specific recipe of how do we do this? Because like many of the component I mentioned, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, um, we didn't explore enough of like how to make those choices. For example, what model architecture to use, um, what method to, to use to learn new class, and as well as like what type of um, support example we provide and how, how could that affect our model performance. So in our follow-up paper, that's a WASPA paper uh, that got awarded, uh, we actually do a more thorough experiment and to 
to get like audio specific recipe of how to get best performance uh, under this framework. Okay. So lastly, um, I look into learning with iterative human machine interaction because so far uh, the human interaction we look at is just one off. It's just like human provide five example and that's it. So we want to know like if we can uh, ask human input in the iterative process to like refine the model and also um, get human uh, feedback in the in, in in a more like human in the loop fashion. So in that on that end, I look into uh, some common assumptions we have in future learning. As I said, uh, we always assume this support set, like these few examples provided by user is, is a one-off thing and it's easy thing. So we assume that human users can actually provide a few representative examples. Although we're only asking five, five, this should be a valid assumption. Um, and the next assumption we usually made is that we don't, we don't really ask user to provide these five examples in, exp in our experiments. We usually do that by simulating the support set via random and uniform sampling from a test data, which we already have a ground truth target label and to mimic the user, uh, user interaction. However, in reality, it can still be difficult to obtain even just a few examples. Uh, so as I mentioned before, for like rare, um, fine-grained, new sounds, like getting five representative examples might be difficult in some scenario. And moreover, um, these, those example, the examples may be from a very limited context and not representative. Like if it, it, can, it, it might not uh, capture all the variants of the target sound they are looking for. So to um, address some of these issue, we propose to combine active learning and future learning to um, get human feedback in, in real time. So what we do is that we remove the assumption that we can get five examples at, at a time. We just start from one target example uh, as, the as, the target, uh, as the positive example. And then we, at the same time, we just randomly sample uh, 100 non-target non examples from our training set. And then we train our future model and use the trained future model to look into our test sets and do active sampling to find the most informative example. So the most informative example here, we define as the most uncertain example by the model. So um, the, the, the example that the model is not sure how to classify it is probably the most informative example. Then we return that example to human to ask for label and uh, human will you know, either label it as positive, it's the target I'm looking for or negative, this is not what I'm looking for and we will update the support set according to this new label coming from just coming from the user. And we will like um, do this uh, loop iteratively until uh, it hits some uh, upper limit of uh, iteration or the model converge. So here, uh, I believe we run this iteration 100 times uh, to see how what performance we get. Oh, oh I didn't put it, yeah. So basically we, we show that um, uh, by doing this way, we get better model performance by compared to random sampling. So if we just randomly sample from test set and return to the user, um, the, the, the example may be redundant, may be unrelevant, maybe, maybe they are all negative if you are looking for very rare sound. So uh, using active sampling is, is actually a much better uh, approach. And also this way we don't impose any uh, assumption that the user can actually provide some meaningful example, we, we let the model to search meaningful example for the user. So we, we can only start uh, from just as, as few as one example and uh, get to some uh, reasonable model performance. Okay, so uh, I'll, that's a rough uh, summary of what I've done in my PhD. And uh, so we can, uh, I'll summarize by this one last figure. So basically we, we build, um, several different systems that allows a user to uh, interact with. So here, the interactions that user will pr provide, like, hey, here are some examples that I'm, in, that I'm interested in. And we build some system that allows the user uh, to do classification or transcription or source separation. And on top of that, we also look into some different interaction paradigms. So we uh, look into some human in the loop uh, interaction to um, 
help user find more meaningful example to label as well as uh, help model to converge more quickly. Uh, okay, so that's it. And next is a natural next step question is like, what about few shot music generation? Because we do all that classification, transcription, source version thing, what about generation? And um, accidentally my latest work, uh, which I did in my latest intern with Google Magenta, touch upon this topic. So we did some example-based conditioning music generation under the Music LM uh, framework, which was just released a few weeks ago. Uh, but this is not included in my uh, dissertation and more detail on this will be coming soon. Okay, so lastly, I give a special thanks, shout out to my dissertation committee, Juan, Brian, and Nick, uh, as well as my mentors and collaborators uh, in the past years. So Justin, Mark, Rachel, Daniel, and Alisa and Ian. Um, yeah, thanks then. And thank you all for listening. Sorry for the technical issue uh, interruption in between. And uh, I'm now open for any feedback and uh, questions.